Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are still on site in Boston, Massachusetts. We are actually in Cambridge at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We are at the Media Lab right now, and we are going to be talking about all things genetic engineering. We are going to be talking a lot about biology. We're going to be talking a lot about these different nuances of what's going to be happening going into our future. I'm super excited to be talking um, to Pranam Chatterjee, who is a uh, he's a graduate student here at MIT's Media Lab, pursuing mm -hmm. his PhD uh, in Media Arts and Sciences. Yeah. Pranam Chatterjee, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the show. <laughs> thank you for having me. Really I'm appreciate it. Excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Super pumped. Pranam's awesome. He's like a he's like the second generation of uh, taking the CRISPR technology and exploring it and moving forward with it and discovering new things with it. And uh, he's also a really good communicator. He's teaching a class right now um, about genetic engineering. And, uh, and I'm really excited to, to, to talk with him about all of this different stuff. So Pranam, let's, let's start with, you know, let's start with who you are. Sure. Um, so how did you first even realize that, you know, you, you know where you were born, how did you start finding your interests, et cetera? Tell us about that. Yeah, so I mean, I, I grew up in like the, I was born in Florida, but I grew up in the kind of the middle of Georgia, suburbs of Atlanta. And so like that really framed a lot of my upbringing. My, my dad was a scientist, my mom was a scientist. Uh, so they were really, they kind of instilled within us that mentality. I have a twin sister as well who goes to MIT. So my whole family is this really scientific, uh, kind of like eclectic family growing up, um, uh, you know, in, in America, we're, sec we're second, we're immigrants, my parents are immigrants, my sister and her first generation Americans. And so with that background, you know, we were able to explore a lot of stuff. Obviously, you know, science is a cool part of our upbringing. But you know, at first, I was really interested in a lot of different things. And one thing that was really cool about uh, Georgia and living in, I would say, like the Bible Belt of sort, was to was to inter interact with people who have a very, very uh, different mindset than you do. You know, like uh, everyone down there uh, is pretty much, you know, a very strong religious, probably very Christian. Um, you know, and so growing up, I was very interested in like just how people thought. You know, the different world views, like. What was the best way to understand how the world works, and that that got me through, you know, different different uh, studies, different fields of thought. Uh, I, <laughs> I know it's kind of funny, but I spent a lot of my time uh, growing up reading a lot of religious texts just to get to know people around me. You know, like the Bible, the Quran, the 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 Torah. You know, like I spent a summer at a Buddhist monastery. You know, like religion was really interesting to me. My parents were super religious at the same time, and so it was cool for me to see how that worldview, right, the worldview of, um, you know, a relig from a religious studies background could inform how people saw the world, but at the same time approach the world in a more, in a rational perspective. That's kind of what has led me to who I am today. Uh, yeah, uh, so as, as you say that, I'm thinking about all of the different ways that people pick up religion when they're really young and then they slowly sort of start to kind of realize that it's all about the feeling of like spiritually kind of transcending oneself and exactly. and the ego and more so about this collective unity with infinity and the cosmos and etc yeah. and 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 it's, it's so as I think as we're as we move forward actually let's let's jump back into because you started picking up theology you had yeah. two you had two scientific parents yeah yeah, yeah. it's kind of weird and I, and I know why I like even jumped into that was because it was such a like major player in my life not because I'm particularly religious my parents were like I said but um, but you know like the, f the really the one the fun thing about it is that science uh, to me and to what I saw was one way of uh, accumulating knowledge about the world. Like, how did it work? What is the best way of, like, understanding the evidence around us? Well, religion was, you know, another way of thinking. And, 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 and that's why when I went to college for the first time, I went to Dartmouth uh, College for my first two years of undergrad, I wanted to study this. You know, I spent a lot of time reading texts, as I said. 
I then spent a lot of time going to like monasteries, uh, churches, synagogues, learning <laughs> yeah. about this. And then like, what is the next obvious step? You know, while appreciating all the other fields, the obvious next step for me was to study, uh, do religious studies as in college. So it's very different than what we're talking about here today, <laughs> yeah. right? Like talking about genetic engineering. So, yeah. but I actually majored in uh, religious studies at Dartmouth College for two years. Um, I actually concentrated in East Asian religions, uh, yep. like you know, Confucianism, Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism yeah, like you yeah. said, like really things that are very different <laughs> than what I do now. Um, I later realized that the the the, wor the way I wanted to view the world was through reality, um, how things that worked. Um, the kind of the mechanisms why they work and and the, the nature of evidence was super super exciting to me therefore i'm here now i transferred to uh mit from dartmouth where i now study uh, where i studied computer science and molecular biology and you know <laughs> the rest is history i guess so I, I want us to 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 really realize why computer science and molecular mm -hmm. biology is such a crucially interesting pairing yeah because the the co co with code with you know with code in, in, in zeros and ones and binary mm -hmm. and then with A's T's C's and G's yeah. the DNA bases that there is such an eerie similarity yeah. in being able to understand biochemical pathways how things Exa work exactly and and that's I think a new way of approaching biology I know biology has obviously been a discipline that's you know has its way of own way of doing things for many years and you realize that if you're going to come in and be a major player, like actually make a contribution to it, you need to be able to think in a new way, in a different way, maybe even in an advanced way, like so that you can really push the boundaries of the field you're in. And you know, I realize this, that when you're going into biology or going into any field, you wanna do something that people care about, that people think are cool, um, and will have a transformative effect on what humanity is gonna be. So I said really the two things that will do that are, AI, artificial intelligence. We all know how that works and we all know how that's really pervading uh, all these different fields, but also gene editing, right? Like, uh, and just like molecular biology, the tools that biotechnology is giving us, you know, it's changing how, you know, just curing diseases, it's changing agriculture, changing bioenergy, it's affecting a lot of fields. And so if you can, not only if you can merge the two fields, you can really create the synergistic effect that allows you to push forth, uh, you know, research uh, discoveries that people care about. People really, I think, are excited about what we're doing here in the lab, and I hope it stays that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you really identified that, that, bi that um, biotechnology is, ev is going into everything as well as artificial intelligence, really. It's yes. so interesting how biotech's kind of like, is like the secondary, like AI's, of course, there's a lot of overlap right, in the there fields. Is, exactly. Uh, biotech is just going into so many different places, from the food that we eat yeah. to the way that we treat our own um, diseases and ailments um, and prevent them yes. as well. Um, okay, so, so it's it, so even though you made the transition to MIT and you figured out you wanted to do um, computer science and molecular biology, what from there got you to the genetic engineering specifically and yeah, you know, it's not, it wasn't linear, right? Like, it's not me just jumping in from theology directly into CRISPR, gene edit future, <laughs> right? Like, it's not that easy. I think really what made it so cool was that I was able to, uh, you know, stay in a field that was also really interesting in the last five, ten years in, in terms of scientific research, and that's the field of immunotherapy, right? Immunology of sort. So I actually spent most of my undergrad, even while a religion major, my, over the summers and through the school year, I'd work in a research lab studying this one molecule, and that was called the molecule called PD-1. Um, so I don't know if you know what PD-1 is, but it's actually a really, what we call a very hot immunotherapy marker, meaning that it's a molecule that is easily targetable. If we target it, you know, we have the ability to, uh, you know, affect a lot of different things that are happening in your body, especially when it comes to diseases like cancer. For example, right. I'll, t I'll, I'll just make it really brief, but PD-1 is on the surface of our immune cells, right? And if we're able to uh, bind to PD-1, if a cell, another cell is able to bind to PD-1, it can actually turn off the immune system. It'll turn off those immune cells. 
they can't you know protect your body like you know immu immune your immune system does and this is what a cancer cell tries to and do. that's exactly right you guessed it. you you took it a can the uh, out of cancer cells playbook they literally will bind to uh, T cells prevent them from being able to attack the tumor cells. So in the tumor environment, these cells are turned off. And so a lot of what I did as an undergrad was first understand how this happened, the uh, pathways within the T cell that allowed them to get shut down. So I, one of my major papers I published with my lab as an undergrad was uh, understanding the metabolic uh, pathways within the in T cells that have this uh, you know, PD-1 shutdown occurring. Mm -hmm. um, and that way we were able to identify what are the important features of this molecule that made it so special. Um, and then the big, the big uh, you know, biotech pharma interests came into this field, just like maybe about five, 10 years ago, like right, like in the kind of like in the middle of my undergrad, it, people started realizing, hey, if we do something with this molecule, you know, this, this could be a really great treatment. And so, I don't know if you've heard of the new drugs called Keytruda and Optivo. They came out of Merck and Bristol Myers Squibb. I was working at Pfizer uh, over the summer where we were working on antibodies for PD-1. You know, if you can prevent the PD-1 antibody from being ligated, you can keep those immune cells on, and that's what that antibody did. And so now we're, you know, able to, you know, go after uh, disease like melanoma, uh, blood cancers like lymphoma, leukemia in patients that have PD-1 and they exhibit pretty amazing results as a result of this treatment. Yeah. Interesting. So the first foray was into immunotherapies, exactly. and then specifically to make sure that, that immune cells mm. were able to uh, hold, to, cancer cells couldn't block that PD-1 receptor. Immune cool. cells could continue hunting exactly for the cancer cells properly identifying them and killing them. and killing them and that's yeah. powerful right because this is not like standard cancer therapies that are uh, you know very uh, invasive they're not like chemotherapies that can kill uh, healthy cells they're not like radiation therapy that can you know ablate large portions yeah. of like again your your say the immune system your healthy uh, immune cells so this was a targeted treatment for these patients, yeah. and they are, it's now two of the most, I would say, the most prescribed cancer drugs for our patients with these uh, tumors specifically. Gosh, that's also so crucial that rather than doing this full body nuke, yeah. that it's a targeted molecule that comes in and goes straight for exactly. anyone. Exactly, and I think, I think that is uh, you know, a movement going forward. Um, one of still a pretty amazing field is like, how can we use um, you know, uh, what we call these uh, anti blocking antibodies to to affect the immune system so that you stay as healthy and active and your your body stays as healthy and active as possible always looking out for anything that could go wrong it's a very powerful approach and I hope it's something that you know continues to drive the field of therapeutics going forward yep yeah and you were doing this with Harvard Medical School and Pfizer, and, Pfizer, yeah. and then you um, come to do the graduate work yeah so I was like had to make a decision I think at that time we realized that you know immunotherapy had really reached its peak right like this is we've discovered this uh, set of new molecules like antibodies that help uh, treat it. Now, you know, really what is the next great, uh, you know, thing that'll, uh, uh, you know, like biotechnological tool that'll take us into the future. And clearly that was CRISPR, you know, gene editing in general, because, you know, guess what? When you can edit genes, you can edit, uh, you know, you can affect fields like agriculture, you can affect bioenergy, you can affect, uh, you know, the ecosystem, shape the ecosystem simply by editing living organisms and the DNA that makes them up. And so I realized that, you know, if, we're, if you're going to really make a, you know, a big splash and you're going to train on top of this, you want to do it in a field that matters. And I think CRISPR is a super cool field and I'm not, I wasn't one of the first people to do it, but I'm lucky to be in it right now. A reoccurring theme that I'm seeing from Pranam here is that he is going to the edge of what's known, like the edge of immunotherapy. Then he's trying to, you know, which has spurred off these yeah, um, for, yeah. cu for curing melanoma and blood cancers, lymphoma, etc. And then, you know, for working on that. And then there's a new edge, and that edge is the overall edge in genetic engineering. Exactly. And yeah. you, you want to be there. 
We talk about that a lot, is striving to get out of the base camp of knowledge where a majority of people are, yeah. um, kind of in just day to days, and aiming to go to the boundary of human knowledge. Yeah. And I'm glad that you have that as this powerful, like, I want to know what's going on. <laughs> I want to know what's going on with yeah. genetic engineering. I want to be out there. I want to be studying it. I want to be teaching it. Exactly. I want to be advancing it. And you have already been a huge part of advancing it. Right, and that's you know that's a motivation. I want to uh, like you're you know you have a lot of different responsibilities as a scientist, even as a person who like went to MIT. I feel MIT is cool because you're really thought to think outside the box. You know, we're in the media lab of all places where I'm not even in a standard bioengineering program or biology program. <laughs> we're in a place where you can literally go and answer whatever questions you think are interesting. Um, you know, my professor is one of those people. His name is Joe Jacobson. You may have heard of him. Uh, he's the guy who invented the, the Kindle technology, the e-ink. Uh, so he's, and guess where we are now? We're doing CRISPR. So like the fact yeah. is that it's cool to move from field to field always staying at the edge like yeah. can we can we design tools that you know will help us to take these for example gene editing into the future so that more people can use it more people can use it safely and yeah. it can go to a lot more places and that was yeah. my motivation yeah huge shout out to the media lab because the when you come to the boston area you have to come to the media lab and come and look at all of the different fields that the media lab is exploring at mit yeah, this is this is what the cutting edge is they are in so many ways exploring that cutting edge yeah. and um joe jacobson exactly joe jacobson yeah. shout out as well um Okay, so let's actually talk about where we're, so we had a discovery uh, about five, six years ago yep. of CRISPR-Cas9 accelerating uh, our ability to do genetic engineering, yep. um, making it very easy to target, making it very easy to make the genetic edits we need um, inside of specific genes that we're looking at, cells that we're looking at. Exactly. So then now we're kind of following, there's like a big wave that's coming after that. And it's this wave of people like you that are like really understanding how can we make this better? How can we make it more right. effective? Yeah. You know, we, I mean, first of all, like many shout outs to the, guy, the guys who really made, discovered this thing. It's, it's amazing. CRISPR is not something that we invented. It's something we discovered. But to be able to repurpose a system that was originally an immune system for bacteria, for bacteria. into a gene <laughs> editing tool for, yeah. for to go into humans, into plants, into animals is amazing, first of all. So yeah. shout out to all like the people who came before me in this field. And but shout out to bacteria yeah, too. Yeah, bacteria in nature that nature. made this uh, amazing system. Three and a half-ish billion years of, evolution, of yeah. evolution, which is why bacteria has so many of these different ways of protecting themselves, protecting right? Themselves, and that's yeah, what we yeah. take, you know, like bacteria can protect themselves in so elegant of a fashion, you know, we can definitely see how can that be used in a in a in an elegant manner so that it can be used to tr you know treat diseases or or you know used for agricultural purposes whatever. And so, you know, as the second generation of CRISPR scientists as you said <laughs> said before, um, my job or my interests lie in t really not just tinkering with it, but kind of revolutionizing the technology. Yes. First of all, so that it's safer, right? So yeah. we can uh, make sure that this technology doesn't do what we don't want it to do. Yeah. And secondly, give the ability to go and make the changes you want to make. Don't be limited by what the regular CRISPR system has, the limitations it has. And so. You know, at the early stage of our, you know, research uh, in CRISPR in our lab, you know, me and a few other grad students in the lab, uh, Noah, shout out to Noah, I got to shout out everyone shout because out they all, it's all a team effort, you know, yeah. we do it together. That's right. But, you know, like what we really did focus on first is making it safe because if you don't make the system safe, you're not going to be able to apply it in all of these different settings. And one of the things that really is kind of dangerous and like you really want to avoid is something we call off-target effects. You know, okay. if a, what if just say you have a gene or a specific target sequence that you want to go to, but there again, there's another sequence somewhere else in a different gene that is very similar, maybe mm -hmm. one or two base DNA bases off. That's not very much different. Sometimes the original CRISPR system will go to the correct location, which it's supposed to go to, but also go to the wrong gene, go to the mm. wrong location. Mm. And that's what we call an off-target effect. And mm -hmm. it's very important that we uh, figure out solutions to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because once you go into a clinical trial, you don't want to 
accidentally edit the gene that codes for brain function or heart function or anything like that. You want to just edit the gene that has the mutation, the, the change, the abnormality, and make the change and be done with it. And so that's what we focused on. Um, yep. what, we, what we built was a system that essentially destabilized the CRISPR system in general at the wrong site, but kept it stable at the right site. So when it's stable, yeah, yeah. it can do what it needs to do. It can yeah, yeah, target yeah. the spot, it can make the edit. If it goes to the wrong spot, you don't want it to do it. And that's what our system did. And you, made it, you destabilized it when it was at the wrong Correct. Cheese. And people had tried to do it before. Um, there were ways to do it where you could take the enzyme and you could uh, you know, reduce the charge of the enzyme so it doesn't bind the DNA as strongly. You kind of yeah, destabilize yeah. the DNA yeah. so that it only binds strongly when it's at the correct site, but not when it's at the wrong site. So that was a protein approach. But guess what? Every time you have a new protein, you have to you know, go through the long, arduous process of making sure that protein is good, it does what it needs to do, and all of that. So we were like, how about the targeting molecule? In CRISPR, the way CRISPR targets uh, is by using a piece of RNA. RNA has bases, so it can bind to DNA, uh, which is what you want to do. And so right, the regular system uses RNA, take, attaches the enzyme to the RNA, and takes it and makes the edit. However, RNA binds to DNA when it, when it, when it comes to the correct uh, spot or whatever spot of DNA it's at. However, the repulsion between RNA and DNA is not actually as strong as the repulsion between DNA and DNA. So we thought if we could add pieces of DNA into the RNA molecule, we could destabilize the CRISPR system at wrong sites, so it doesn't work, don't want to edit those sites, and only keep it stable at the correct sites, and that's what we were able to do. And so we were really excited about this technology going forward in clinical trials uh, to make a very safe but still very effective CRISPR system. Um, that was what I did for the early part of my master's thesis. Yes, yes, and then that, that definitely led you, because you're already starting to work with the Cas9 yeah. system, then you're able to really get into more nitty gritty. Off-targeting was one thing, so yeah. you were solving off-targeting, exactly. which is huge. And then, then where'd you move into after yeah, so that? Like, so I was saying there's really two main limitations of CRISPR, um, on, of using it for gene editing. There, there are, quite, there are well, others, but the two main ones is first the off targets, which I feel like you know, the, our, our lab was able to address, we were able to address together. And then the second uh, real interesting limitation that you know, I previously said that you know, CRISPR could go to any gene, um, but that's actually not true. I kind of lied about that. CRISPR is actually um, has its own targeting limitation. So say you want to go to a specific DNA sequence, right? It's, it's you know, 20 DNA bases long. You want to go there, right? But if you want to go there, you, all, you need two Gs, like A, C, G, and T. You need two Gs beside it. So if you don't have those, just say you want to go to a specific gene you, that you want to specifically fix, but it doesn't have two Gs So at it. the end of the 20 base pairs uh, of, of DNA bases that, you're, the, targeting, that yeah. you're targeting, you need two Gs exactly. for, the, for CRISPR-Cas9 to be able to identify that as where you want to exactly. make an edit. Exactly. That seems like such a big limitation right. to what you can do. So you can even do the math in your head, right? Like one over four to the second is how many times you would see a two Gs. One over four to the second is one sixteenth. But if you can actually go to either, uh, because DNA is double-stranded, we'll liberally say you can go to what, one-eighth, because you can go to either strand. So you can go to a C, CC, or a GG. Right? So, you could, so, with, so with the normal CRISPR-Cas9 system, you're limited to editing an eighth of the human yeah, genome. Yeah, even that's even a little bit liberal. To okay. give, to, like you're giving it a little bit of flexibility okay. there. But um, so it is imperative for us. We realize, you know, we're not going to really be able to use this system if we're restricted by this limitation. Why? Because if you just want to like disrupt a gene, you know, if you just want to like you know, you know, get rid of a specific gene in your body, or you just want to insert it some somewhere in the a new gene somewhere in the body, you can go anywhere in that gene. That gene is pretty long, ten thousand bases long. You're probably going to find two Gs somewhere, right? But just say you want to fix an exact spot. Someone, yeah. a, mute, a disease is caused by yeah. a specific mutation, like sickle cell anemia. It's caused yeah. by one specific mutation. 
you want to fix that specific mutation. So if you cannot go to the, that exact spot, yep. you're pretty limited. Yep. So our goal was to actually expand the range that a CRISPR enzyme could go to. And you know, like, our lab's pretty small, right? We're like me, and I think you may see Noah in the background. <laughs> He's not <laughs> there right now, but he, um, but he and I, you know, we were really intent on finding uh, a, an enzyme that was broader, you know, could go to more places because that would enable us to go to and fix a lot of things yeah. we previously couldn't fix. Yeah. Um, and so. And there's thousands of 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 diseases that are um, the single point mutations. Exactly. And and the great thing is, while we were doing this, there was a new technology that was developed called base editing that could just fix that one thing. So base editing would be really helped by enzymes. That only that can go many places, and so yeah. that was our motivation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, we could, as 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 gene edit genome engineers at the media lab, we're in a really small we're in a small group, and we're amongst very few people who do this kind of thing. <laughs> while we're competing, and we have a lot of other people also trying to do similar stuff, but in huge labs, right? Like six people, uh, sixty molecular biologists in a lab, and so they're utilizing very you know. Uh, large-scale experimental approaches to find these new enzymes, these new tools that are broader, that are more specific. Yeah. Yeah. But we, uh, Noah and I, are, are thankfully computer scientists, like you had mentioned yes. before. And so we were able... Bioinformaticians. Bioinformaticians, yeah. right? Like, we are really capable of using algorithmic power, you know, yeah. computational power to do the discovery process for us. We could write the code and then allow us to discover, say, a new enzyme that could target more molecules, and that's exactly what we did. Badass. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. Isn't that? Isn't so that <laughs> was that it. was pretty fun. And like we developed this cool pipeline called Spamalot. I don't know for those of you who know like the Monty Python reference. I, I'm going <laughs> to stop it right there. But like um, anyway, we built this really cool bioinformatics pipe pipeline that allowed us to say, hey, here are all the CRISPR enzymes out there. Here are their predicted. PAM sequences. This is how many cool. bases they need to target. And yeah. we were able to identify one that only needed one G. One uh, G instead of instead two. two. So if yeah. you do the math again in your head, one over four now, because you don't you only have four bases. And if you do it on both strands, that covers about one half of the of, of, of the genome. Yeah. So we were able to find an enzyme that has affinity towards one G and therefore can target about fifty percent of the genome. And that was I think a big ad advancement, and we were uh, published in the in Science is Open Access Journal, and you know, like published in Science is Open Access Journal. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, it was. That's it, awesome. It was like it's somewhere that every you know, like you know, people are now starting to really use. I you know, I'm sending this uh, enzyme out to a lot of people to try it out. You know, they, yeah. a lot of people are interested in using it because now, guess what? You if you're working on a specific disease, if you're interested as a geneticist, if you want to study a specific gene, you can do it do so much more broadly because you can target a lot more uh, sequences. And that was what our computational pipeline gave us this enzyme, which we then put in right behind you as we're, uh, we're in the lab right now. We were able to go and test it in human cells that are right in that incubator and show that this, that this enzyme was broad, that this enzyme could target a lot more sequences than we previously could target. So with your computational pipeline, you're able to identify ways that genetic engineering can more easily make the targeting and the cutting more effective. Exactly. And editing more effective. Then um, this is called SC. SC Cas9. Cas9. So the original Cas9 comes from Streptococcus pyogenes bacteria. That's the strep throat bacteria that you have. But we have, uh, we found a Cas9 that comes from a similar bacteria that is uh, that is found in dogs or in, infects cats and cows, really animals. Mm -hmm. It's called Streptococcus canis for the dog, mm -hmm. for infecting the dog. And so that's where we found this new Cas9. And you know, that wasn't even the end of the story. We yeah. were able to use this pipeline to discover another another enzyme that could go to the other 50% of the genome. We didn't cover the other 50%, but we found one that needed two A's, yeah. right? So if you could eventually get to one A, right, you cover the other 50%, 50%. right? Because you could cover the T and the A on the both strands. Yeah. But two A's already gets you to another Advancement. of yeah. the other 50%, which is yeah. a really cool, I thought it cool. So together, two enzymes 
that we have in the lab right here, you know, yeah. can cover a significant portion of the genome. This so heavily speaks to the importance of a computational biology. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's what made it possible. Where there's no way we were going to carry out huge experiments. <laughs> yeah. First of all, we don't have the people to do it. Second of all, it's difficult when you're like not, you know, you know, the CRISPR lab, you know, like the big CRISPR labs are capable of doing these things, but we, we have to take our own approaches. And I, I'm pretty, ex uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty psyched that we could do it pre uh, so effectively in the lab right here. Yeah, it's, it's such an also, it's, it's so visibly pieced together where it's like this first advancement that comes about five or so years ago. And then the second wave, including computational biology, processing and figuring out all of the bacteria that's evolved. What do these bacteria know as immune in, in their immune organizations that, that we don't yet know? And how can we apply that to our lives? And so you get to study all of that exactly. and discover, make new discoveries around genetic Yeah, we're basing it off of what nature is giving us, right? Like they give us a lot of information. If you were doing all of this from scratch, it'd be pretty hard. Like you're not, we're not as good as nature at fine tuning uh, biological systems, right? And so we're taking a page out of nature's playbook, and you know we're 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 really excited about what that can even give us going forward. There are a lot of new enzymes and proteins that have really cool properties that we're really excited to exploit in the future. And it's it's also nuts because this is already now we're now we're we're talking because you mm. found this you you only need a single G yeah. half of the genomes available to make genetic engineering edits to it 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 becomes now a we're not ignorant anymore. No. So if we know that we're screening ourselves, like if you are about to um, have, you have a partner and you're about to pursue procreating, having a child into the world, screen yourself, have your partner screened, and then you know better if you are going to pass along a mutation that's gonna cause a disease. Correct. And then furthermore is even when it's, even when the process does start of, of, um, of a, the fertilization of an embryo that you can still then check again to make sure that it absolutely doesn't have the mutation. And if it does have the mutation, you have full control of making sure your child does not have that disease now. Correct. For, and this is even today for 70% of all uh, of single point mutations. Or, yeah. Yeah. And that, we, can, we can fix those, right? And that's what's powerful. You know, like we have like... First of all, you know, you have, just a few years ago, a lot of these genetic diseases were incurable. And with the advent of not only just new CRISPR technologies, but base editing, right, the ability to just flip a single base, as I said before, the, these technologies together make it really easy. Like you said, 70% we can, we can target. And so when you do get to that stage where, you know, you want to make sure that your offspring doesn't have um, a genetic disease, you have one of two options, really. You, you, if you think that the, op if you know that the offspring will have that disease, you could go in with the CRISPR system and, and just design, you know, an RNA that targets and the enzyme that goes to that specific location and make the edit right after fertilization and then make sure that the cells were pr properly edited, the embryos were properly edited and then re-implant that back into the mother. So you know for a fact that your child will not have the disease. At the same time, a more conservative approach that still works really well is you could just uh, you know, do in vitro fertilization and just make sure that yeah. the embryo that you implant doesn't have the mutation. So you have yeah. options and yeah. there's I don't see a reason why genetic diseases is going to, are going to like last for a while That's because right. we have the tools not only to make sure at first you're go safe, but if not, go in and programmably change what you need to change. Um, and what we're doing here in the lab is giving you the tools, giving you know, the general community the tools to be able to do that. And the beauty of this all is that it's not even just limited to medicine. It's li it's, you can do this in like plants, in, in, for bio, biofuels, you know, like, like we're able to even make malaria, uh, mosquitoes resistant to malaria by introducing genes that uh, confer malaria resistance uh, and into these organisms and have that reproduce. Like we're, CRISPR and gene editing has enabled all of these technologies that will make our lives better, that will make our technology safer, um, and you know, overall, it will hopefully make society a better place than it is today. But 
you know, it's young. And we're, we, as a, me as a CRISPR 2.0 scientist, <laughs> you know, it has to make sure that, that we hopefully will get to that stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's there's a, an interesting sort of, um, like, big history understanding of things where you look at um, humans trying to figure out how to uh, how to do breeding within genetics, yeah. and it took so long to get what we wanted done. Yeah, this is what we <laughs> this is what we wanted. You know, like, like, like even when you just say just say you wanted to, you're in a research lab and you work with like mice, right? Imagine how long it would take to get the mice with the exact like what we call phenotype, like kind of like how a, a pro, an offspring mice that has the traits you wanted to have to study. Right? It'd take you months, right? It'd take you years in the lab to do this iteratively until you get a mouse that reproduces well. Now we can literally just go into an animal, into a plant, into, you know, one day into a human and then be able to make the change. Yeah. That change is permanent, right? Yeah. That, that's what's beautiful about the system and that's what gives us so much power. At the same time, there's risks and responsibilities that have to be assessed, but we're also, that's something that we also work on and we do that by educating uh, the people around us about the system. These, uh, <laughs> yeah, these, these, uh, the, these risks uh, are, and these ethics and these geopolitics around these yeah. technologies are nuts. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and it's and there's a lot of pieces that come into this puzzle. Uh, we were, you know, geopolitics mm. come into this puzzle. We have uh, the ethical quandaries that come into this puzzle. What should or shouldn't be ameliorated as a as a disease. Yeah. Um, there's the ethics of who is getting the access to the exactly. augmenting technology, and that's that that you know that. As a CRISPR scientist, you have a sense of responsibility um, to make sure that the right hands get on it, and all, not only the right hands, but the people who understand how the system works. Unfortunately, it's not always how it works, and I'm sure uh, you know all of you guys out there. You know, everyone probably has heard about the CRISPR baby scandal that happened in China, where a scientist called He Jianghui uh, was able to edit the uh, the, the em embryos of two babies who are now born, uh, Lulu and Nana, with their names. And unfortunately, this was our first foray into human embryo editing, right? And you know that's uh, that was that's something that we weren't ready for as CRISPR scientists because we we don't feel that you know we've done all the checks needed to make sure that CRISPR does exactly what we wanted to do all the time, and you know that 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 uh, you know that kind of like that uh, apprehension manifested itself uh, where the edits for these two children were not expect were not what was needed. Um, what this guy was trying to do was prevent HIV transmission uh, or pretty much make these children immune to HIV by editing their gene. They weren't trying to cure a genetic, he wasn't trying to cure a genetic disease. He, he didn't even like really prevent them from trans, uh, getting HIV. What he did was essentially gave them an enhancement, a protection of sorts. And not only did he want to do that, he also didn't do it in a very clean fashion. You know, like yeah. unfortunately the edits to Lulu and Nana were not exactly what is needed to make sure that you have HIV resistance in the future. So the point is that, you know, like this, the geopolitics, as you said, are, you know, super critical. We want to make sure that it's not getting into the wrong hands and, you know, the regulations are there yeah. so that until we're ready to go, you know, nothing crazy happens. But because something like this happens, you know, what it does is it decreases, sometimes it decreases public trust in, in your right. technology. People are scared of it. You know, imagine. Sometimes it also makes it more easy, uh, easily. Uh, it becomes more in the public eye, which yeah. makes it more receptive, so that it's not like, oh, what is this gene engineering thing? But rather, you actually have seen genetic engineering it's more a, in the news, and then it whether it's a bad or good thing. And and you know, like I'm sure you've heard of like the biohacker community too. They get you know people who are not like CRISPR scientists, they actually uh, will be able to get their hands on the CRISPR system and want to do stuff with it. You know, hopefully not inject it in themselves. I'm sure, I think someone has done that. But um, being able to use it for their own purposes, which is fine in itself, but as long as they know and they have an understanding of how to do it and how to do it properly, you know, that, that is the main ethical question. Like, at what point do we let, pe let this technology run free as the scientists who are developing the technology itself. So, um, you know, it's not, an, it's not an answered question, but we're still like 
figuring, we're ironing out all of those details. And where do the scientists work with the politicians and the mm -hmm. ethicists and the philosophers? And w when are we actually ready? Because sometimes when we look at civilization, yeah. it's it really doesn't look like we've advanced our way out of the fifth grade quite yet in yeah. terms of our own ability to, to not get into wars and to not pursue conflicts with each other, but rather have that sense of unity. Right. We have to mature as well first. Correct, yeah. yeah. And that's, I think, I feel, uh, like I said before, I as a CRISPR scientist feel a responsibility to educate people about how CRISPR, how gene editing works. That's because right. It's not gonna just be like, you know, the select group of people who are gonna be using it. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> one day it's gonna come to everyone. It's gonna be, and it's already becoming thousands and thousands of people soon you're teaching a class right now yeah it's going to become millions really fast and it's great to have those millions because you also want the creativity exactly. of those millions exploring it's it. it's wonderful because this is one of those technologies that will use the societal like collective knowledge to advance itself when yeah. a technology affects so many people you know the input of everyone comes into view and if that input is an educated input Right? If people understand how the technology works at its foundation, what its applications could be, then we have an informed society and we have a, one in which the technology will be used properly and for the right purposes. I'm not gonna be the one who defines that. My goal is to build the technology and then teach it how to use it to people. And that's what I'm doing actually this, yep. this, this uh, January. I'm teaching Teach a us. CRISPR class here at MIT. Teach us about it. Yeah, so like we really, it's really cool. Um, I mean, I've, I actually explained a lot of what I'm talking about in the class here today, yeah. but, um, but the class is really, uh, really a short four, four session uh, course where students can come in, they can learn about how CRISPR works, like the, the, syst the bacterial system, then they'll learn about the mechanism of how it works, like what are the pieces of CRISPR that are important for you to do gene editing, what are the applications that you can put it to so that you use gene editing in the right, app in the right ways, and then they'll actually come into this lab right in here and do CRISPR experiments. This is where they can realize this is a responsible way of doing science, whether or not they're scientists in a different field. Obviously some of them are like biologists, chemists, they want to use the technology for their research, but there are people who are like policy, uh, policy people and um, you know, uh, like students who are just like there to learn about cool new things who, wa who will come in contact with the technology here in our lab and do it in a really fun, uh, safe manner too. And so they can go out and you know, be able to use it very, in a very in a responsible manner. And you know, in the final class, we'll talk about what we were talking about today, ethics, right? Like how, how do we together as a society face the problem of you know, changing who we are as people, yeah. right? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? What do you think? I want to hear these opinions. I want to hear your opinion. Overall good thing. Yeah. Overall good thing and <clears throat> definitely it's the next evolution and, yeah. we need, and we need to be wanting to get, drive ourselves to the next evolution um, in a way that is steering ourselves not off the cliff, exactly. but uh, more uh, towards the up, up the up the mountain. Yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I want to ask you, what is going on with your technology next? Because yeah. you know, because you're doing this computational biology, it's opening up the doors in so many new ways, and you're yeah. really excited about that. Um, so tell us more about yeah, like, so where it's going next. So we're really interested in a few questions, right? Like I, especially me, as going forward, is I really still want to get to the hundred percent, right? Like of genomic yeah. coverage. We're continually improving our algorithms. We're improving our experimental techniques uh, so that we are able to do that hundred percent genomic coverage. That would be cool, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like then you really have free range on where you can go in the genome, and we're close. You know, we have two or three enzymes in our hands that could be great methods to engineer. Uh, also, we have this computational tool that can take us and find uh, you know, new enzymes that could be very powerful. So that would be a really um, critical goal that we're working on currently. A second goal is definitely to go back to this idea of base editing, right? Like, as you said before, the current set of base editors can go and fix about, what, 70% of all what we call pathogenic SNPs, mutations, single mutations that cause disease. And so the, it would be wonderful, again, to really um, treat the other, uh, you know, a f certain number of diseases, not only because it'll fix, you know, mutations that cause disease, but also gives you a lot more power as a genome engineer in whatever application to be able to flip 
DNA bases. The power of this technology lies in not having to really make too much of a change, right? You don't want to have to cut a d d piece of DNA every single time you want to make a change. You just want to do a nice, clean, chemical transition of a base. Just say you have a C, right? A, C, G, and T for your DNA. Just say you want to go from a C to a T. We can do that already. How about an A to a G? We can do that already. And so, you know, we have the ability to do these small changes, but when you get to like things like going from an A to a C or, you know, an T to an A, that gets, it's getting harder. You know, we're not, it's not as easy to do all these different base conversions. Right now, we can do four of them. There's 12 in total, right? If you do the math, there's 12 DNA base uh, conversions that you can do. So I really am interested in designing new tools to be able to do every type of gene uh, DNA edit as you can. Couple that with this tar expanded targeting space. And now you can literally do whatever genome editing you want to do. I think that would be a great goal for myself and through my PhD. Um, awesome. Yeah. Expanded targeting and? And all base conversions. All base conversions, yeah. cool. That yeah, would be like, so you know, cool. like, you have a lot of power. That's a lot of, yeah, totally. Yeah. That, that's a big uh, moving of the human knowledge edge for, forward. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that's, that'd be see, this is moonshots right here. <laughs> this is how you do moonshots. I'm serious. To all the young people, you're 24, right? Yeah, I'm actually 26. Yeah. He's 26. Brown's 26. But when you look at young people in their mid 20s, I'm 26 as well. Nice. That you got to have moonshot goals yeah. and you have this moonshot goal you're hearing it right here um, pushing the boundary of knowledge forward past what is known and doing things like helping really move the ball forward with eradicating disease making augmentations and so much more huge 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 yeah. and computational biology is so interesting <laughs> i love it um i want to know post what are you thinking post what you want to get done here in the PhD. Are you thinking entrepreneur, professing? Yeah, where are you thinking? Yeah, what's well? really wonderful about this field is that it's super open, right? Like you have, everything you build can be very powerful, right? Like people want to use it. So there's a power in like the IP that you hold, the patents that you have that, you know, encompass all the work we're doing. Um, you know, it would be really cool one day to like, you know, do a startup or uh, be an entrepreneur because you can bring your technologies to a lot of people. At the same time, I'm always interested in solving new problems, right? I've, I'm the person who switched from like religion to immunology to computer science, yeah. molecular biology. You know, like I love exploring new fields and I think an academic setting is one of the best places you can do it. I think I'm naturally built for a, a place that is, you know, free thinking, exploring, um, you know, solving cool questions, always looking for the new thing. So, I, you know, my whole dream, my whole life was to be a professor and, you know, that would be wonderful. But, You're a you good know, teacher. I, I don't know about that, but like really, another, like we can't even discount like going into like something like industry because like I said, yeah. you, I, you remember the Opdivo and Keytruda, the yeah. these yeah. big drugs, you know, that are gonna cure a lot of people yeah. are coming in industry. So, you know, you gotta what apply I, what's up here and what's being done into the world. And yeah. so that you get it out, out there. there. Right? And yeah. so like, you feel a responsibility to do all of these things, but yeah. you can't do all of them. You have to really pick what you want. And I think I'll save that judgment till when I'm done with the you're PhD. Yeah, yeah. But you know, like I'm excited. I think like totally. as long as you're able to solve cool questions and do good science, like I'm happy. <laughs> How about we ask you, okay, so there's, what do you think is the role of regulation mm. in this being part of the second wave? What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that you see as very important, but you also realize is very difficult, right? Like, you know that it's important to be able to make sure that it gets in the right hands, like you said. But at the same time, you also want to make sure that this technology is used as broadly as possible, because you, can, you see firsthand when you do your experiments what this can be you know what what this technology can be not like again i'm not the person who discovered crispr i'm the person who's making it so that it can be used by other people for really transformative purposes i am the tool developer of sorts right like enabler like i enable people to do it and so you want people to be enabled you want them to be empowered to do different technologies not just for medicine but agriculture energy you know uh, you know, geo uh, ecological engineering, whatever. And so, you know, like, 
I, I want there to be the ability for people to do good science and to do good uh, applications, or use a good, uh, CRISPR for good applications. At the same time, I know that you know, we, uh, like as a society, we collectively need to decide where to go with this technology. Even if I am the one putting in the 18 hours of work in the lab doing it, it's not up to me you know, to say where is my technology going because it's not going to just affect me. Yeah, it's yeah. going to affect you. It's going to yeah. affect all everyone out there. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, we, we collectively bear that burden. And so I'm interested always to hear from you guys, uh, you know, people Let like us you know. out there. Let yeah. us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, what do you think about this technology and you know, what can we do as genome engineers to, you know, to make sure that it gets into the right hands and is used for the right purposes? That's right, that's yeah. right. Okay, a couple quick questions yes. on the way out that we, like, yeah. that we like asking our guests. What do you think is a core driving principle of your life? Mm, yeah, it's, 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 it's to, make an, to make an impact that will lead to more impact. Uh, meaning that I'm here doing science so that people in the future will also be able to do good science. So that I'm, you know, hopefully will help cure a disease so that those people whose diseases were cured can ho go and make an impact in the I world. You know, that's me. I, I, am, I am one point in the timeline of humanity. But I hope that time point, you know, is, has enough, has push, it keeps pushing humanity forward because I believe in what we can do and where, what this world can be and you know being able to do gene editing be able to, to do maybe even some you know, computer science and you know understanding even the past with religion all of these things have contributed to like understanding people and and giving them the ability to like make an impact while you're also making an impact too yeah Again, this is coming. You're just like I'm going to the edge of knowledge, and I'm going <laughs> to push. That's what I want to do. Right? I'm pushing the edge so that other people can build on top of that in the future. That's so beautiful. Love it. <laughs> it's fun, right? Like I, I have fun every day coming to the lab. People say, "Why do you work like 20, 18, 20 hours a day?" I literally work nonstop because it's fun. You know, like you got to love what you do every moment of your life. Yeah. yeah no yeah. matter what you do, whether it's talking to you, you know, people about yeah. it, whether teaching a class, whether it's just doing a random experiment, yeah. running a control, you know, like like everything is contributing. Yeah, you're contributing to the knowledge of the world and and that's like I feel very very lucky to be able to do that. All right, I have a good question yeah, for you okay. because you spend so much of your time understanding um, the com computation in biology. Yeah. So then you must understand then how a, a cell could be potentially computed, all of the functions oh, in a cell. Oh, yeah. So how could all of the civilization evolving on a rock be computed? So do you think we're in a simulation? I would not. <laughs> I am not going to answer that question, but I think you're on to something really, really good there. <laughs> I'll have to sit on think about that. Expand more. Why do you? Why do you think? You know, it's it's <laughs> computation is so you know you realize it doesn't come out of nowhere, right? Like the way life is formed. You know, even CRISPR, right? CRISPR is like such a beautiful thing that nature and evolution has given to us. You think that there's some ability to understand the patterns, right? Like there's, there is some programmable elements to how we as humans, to how society, how reality is programmed, that you're like, this is, uh, you know, it would make sense for there to be some alternate explanation for what we're living in. And, and, and you know, I'm doing my part to like understand that small portion of it. But if we one day come to the understanding that this is all just one big simulation, I'm not, who am I to say that's not, that's not true, you know? I'm all for evidence and you know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we're, so. we're digging into the code of the simulation exactly. to, fig to figure it that's all out. That's what, probably what we're yeah. doing right now. We're gonna, we're gonna simulate the evolution of a civilization on a rock just like Earth orbiting a star and we're gonna fast forward oh, six million what's years gonna happen? until this point. Until this point. And this you're gonna be like, okay, yeah, fine. That's, <laughs> that's Can we fast forward a little bit more? more see what's, see where's going on? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, and last question that yes. we like to ask on the show. What do you think's the most beautiful thing in the world? Hmm. Most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, I don't know. I have to say, I, I, I don't know. I have to, I have to go with like, what I, I have to say, sen the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, like, I just think it's 
it, it's why we exist. You know, like I, I am a pretty practical person. Yeah. Essential dogma is like the ability to go from a, a DNA to RNA to a protein, yeah. which codes for all of life. Yeah. If that pro that process is so beautiful, and if and if that doesn't exist, we don't exist. Nothing exists. Like our ability to process all of this doesn't exist. And I know it's a super scientific answer, and it's like no, it's it, great. But that is <laughs> it's great. It is literally like it. It every day I'm in the lab, it is, and every day I just live. I'm like, this is this this is the central dogma of molecular biology oh, at yeah, work. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. Love it. You, if you're so passionate about what you do, that the central dogma of molecular biology becomes <laughs> the most beautiful I'm, thing in the world. I'm probably really crazy. I love it. No, because I'm really crazy too. And a lot of people like us are really crazy in love with what they are building. And those are the people that are pushing and pushing the brinks um, and the edges. So I love that about you. I'm glad that you answered it that way. It's really beautiful. Um, okay, I feel, I feel like we did a really good job. Yeah. We did a really good job, Pranam. This has been such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I had such a fun a time. Yeah. Super fun and time. Feel free to come back. If you guys out there want to know more about the Media Lab, feel free to, you know, like comment and I'll, I'm happy to like, I'm happy to like see what everyone has to say. Totes. Yeah, yeah. we got, so for, for you guys, thanks for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you so much. We would love, love, love for you to comment below with your thoughts about what we talked about regarding genetic engineering and all of the nuance. So let us know what you think. Also, do check out Pranam's links in the bio below. Also, definitely build, go and push the edge of what's known in our world. Go and do build. <laughs> yes, manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Join us on Patreon links below because we want to continue supporting our efforts in going scaling and take having these conversations shared with you around the world. We love you so much. We'll see you soon. Peace.